stage with it before it was our opening remarks today. Uh, one quick note before we get started. You'll notice that the panel is missing one person. Unfortunately, Sean Batija's flight was delayed, so he's not going to be able to make it here uh, to speak, but he will be showing up a little bit later uh, this afternoon, so you'll have the chance to, to meet him, but he won't be able to speak on this panel. Um, but chairing this panel uh, is Minister Ali Jalali. Uh, you have his biography in your uh, in your agendas, but something that you should know about Ali is he's the kind of guy that uh, generates the kind of respect that if, if he were to pat you on the back, I think you would probably list it on your CV. Uh, he's that kind of man. So with that, I will turn the program over to Minister Jalali. Thank you, Tyler. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this panel, which is uh, going to focus on uh, economic development, economic uh, integration, regional economic integration. And uh, the, in the uh, next one hour and 30 minutes, we will uh, have uh, uh, our panelists uh, present some of their thoughts, and then that will uh, then we will go to question and answer period uh, and uh, we'll look at the uh, challenges and obstacles to regional economic integrations. Uh, it will be probably focused on the Mediterranean uh, area and also the Gulf. However, there will be some other issues that actually uh, uh, you know, applies to all regional uh, economic uh, integration. Uh, the fact that one of the most notable trends in global economy in recent times, in recent years, has been an accelerated movement towards uh, regional economic integration. What it means is that uh, different countries in the region are trying to agree on removing or reducing the barriers to uh, free flow of goods and services in their areas. And what it helps these countries actually, it, it uh, uh, reduces the cost both for consumers and also for producers. And uh, however, in order to have an economic integration in different areas, there are certain issues that should exist there. These days we are talking about uh, Central Asia and South Asia, uh, you know, economic integration uh, initiative, what they call it, New Silk Road initiative. However, if you look at the area and uh, the re prerequisites for, for uh, regional uh, economic integration, uh, you will see that there are so many problems, so many challenges before a, a, a regional economic integration actually actually takes place. One of the issues is infrastructure. If you do not have infrastructure, sufficient and developed infrastructure, it is very difficult to have that kind of thing. Other uh, issues is uh, a legal framework. And you have to standardize some of the legal framework, either in the context of uh, the World Trade Organization or regionally, in order to facilitate that kind of a free flow of, of, of trade and services. And then also there are border control issues. There are many in many areas. There are borders who are porous, and even if you have that kind of agreement of in the regional economic, then you 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 uh, cannot control the borders. Then still, it it is not going to work. One of the major examples that I've seen in my experience was in Kazakhstan in uh, 1994, when uh, uh, Philip Morris actually uh, set up uh, the, the, the cigarette manufacturing uh, plant in, in, in Almaty. However, as I spoke with, with, the, with the head of, while they were investing in, in Almaty and also they were providing the benefit for the workers there, the, the cost of the cigarette that produced was far less than the smuggled cigarette that were crossing across the border from Russia. So therefore, that company actually soon became uh, you know, bankrupt. The same thing, look at the Afghanistan, Pakistan. The issue, that because of the porous border, the re-export of, of goods which comes to Afghanistan, passes through Pakistan without uh, you know, uh, leaving duty on it or tariffs, 
comes to Afghanistan and we export it to Pakistan, so Pakistan actually uh, suffers from that. Uh, this was one of the major issues uh, uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan when they were negotiating the uh, transit uh, trade agreement with Pakistan. So it is, uh, on the other hand, political issues are very important. There are many countries who do not want to lose control over certain policies, their fiscal policies. And uh, therefore, if, uh, many years ago, there was an arrangement under the OECE in Central Asia between three adjacent oblasts or provinces of three uh, Central Asian countries. That was Osh in Kyrgyzstan, that was Andijan in uh, Uzbekistan, and uh, the uh, uh, Khurjan in, in Tajikistan. Uh, they had to reintegrate their, their uh, uh, you know, uh, control of borders in order to, f uh, to apply similar kind of a standards to uh, stem the flow of drugs in this area. It did not work after two years because of the political concerns of these deep countries. They do not want it to lose control over their uh, you know, border policies. So these are some of the, of the issues that uh, should be there. Uh, on the other hand, uh, during this uh, panel, I hope we uh, discuss some of the tensions, some of the, uh, uh, between free trade, in protectionism that uh, you see in many countries these days. Uh, these tensions actually affect both the uh, regional economic integration, at the same time the, uh, the uh, operation of World Trade Organization. Uh, uh, the, uh, you might have seen that during the uh, World Trade Organization meetings in, uh, in uh, the United States or in Europe, you see demonstration of many people because there are many criticism uh, against the free trade because free trade actually takes the, the uh, uh, becomes the, 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 the uh, trend that undermines sovereignty of the countries and it actually deprives workers of that country from certain privileges that that country can offer. Uh, the, uh, on the other hand, protectionism you know, in, in different uh, you know forms, still persist in, in, in the world. Some of them is uh, because uh, the uh, many countries are concerned that this free trade and free services, uh, free movement of services and trade, actually undermines the employment nationally, and uh, the, the uh, many countries can export their, their, their labor to other countries for cheap labor. The other is uh, like uh, kind of a protection of population. You have heard that South Korea several times actually banned or uh, the uh, import of uh, beef from the United States, uh, claiming that it was tainted. The, uh, the defense industries in many countries actually have also destruction of countries that actually undermines free trade and sales. So retaliation is another issue. Uh, therefore, uh, during this uh, uh, you know, panel discussion that we have, I hope that our uh, panels, panelists will discuss some of the uh, challenges and some of the benefits of regional economic integration. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel of uh, speakers here. Uh, uh, to my uh, left is uh, uh, Sinan, uh, Olgan, he comes from the uh, Carnegie Europe in Brussels, where he is f uh, focusing on the uh, Turkish foreign implication of Turkish foreign policy for the European Union and uh, the United States, uh, particularly with regard to Turkey's regional stance in its role in nuclear energy in climate issues. And then to my far right uh, left is uh, Dr. Tarek Khoury. He's a professor at the uh, school of uh, the Dubai School of uh, Government, and uh, he uh, research associate at the Dubai Initiative, where he focuses on the political economy in macroeconomic aspects of Gulf state regional integration. Uh, I, I uh, expect that each speaker to speak for 15 minutes, and then after that we will open it for question and answer. So first, uh, you Senan.
Minister Jalali, uh, many thanks. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here with this distinguished uh, audience. I would first of all like to thank RNSCC and, and SAM for uh, having invited me here to my hometown in Istanbul uh, be, and to be able to address you. Uh, now, uh, what I want to do today is actually start with politics, continue with economics, and then come back to politics. Uh, and the reason is, uh, even though the title of this discussion uh, relates to regional economic integration, as we have heard on the previous panel, uh, when we talk about security, economic security, uh, we, need, we really need to address uh, some of the core political concerns. And when we look at what's happening on the ground today uh, in many countries in the southern Mediterranean, uh, with elections uh, now, uh, both in Egypt, in Morocco, in Tunisia, uh, and hopefully in other places in the region, one of the core challenges that we see is how do we consolidate this process of democratic transition? And uh, one of the key issues there is really if the new governments can actually succeed economically, giving hope to their citizens, then this is going to help in consolidating this democratic transition. So there is a direct link between the economic performance and democratic consolidation. And here trade has its role to play, and I think it's, it's really a, a fundamental role. So uh, from one perspective, this is really the linkage between what I'm going to talk about in terms of regional economic integration and its political implications. And the second link is, when I was trying to understand why is it that, uh, and here I really wonder how you call this, whether it's the Arab Spring, whether it's the awakening, whether it's the uprisals, but however you want to name it, why did it start in Tunisia? Because for people like me, who always have a proclivity to look at the economic side of things, when I look at the Tunisian economy, or for that matter for the Egyptian economy, things are, were not too bad, especially if you compare to the northern side of the Mediterranean. You had you know, growth 4 or 5% and so on. But then when you start to dig behind those figures, you, you, you realize that what was missing was actually inclusive growth. So yes, you did have growth, you did see that, but you didn't see the propagation or the ramifications, the dissemination of that growth throughout society. It was essentially, and this is not me saying, but a number of World Bank reports, for instance, that growth was limited, the benefits of growth were limited to the people who had good relations with the government. So those were the ones who could actually get access to capital to fund whatever investment they wanted to do. So it's really an issue of inclusive growth. And here as well, going forward, if the governance structure, if the political economy is going to be improved, trade has its role to play. Now my argument, and uh, perhaps the reason why I'm here today, uh, is really to challenge the current blueprint for regional integration. Now, what is the current blueprint for regional integration? And here the region is essentially the Mediterranean region. Uh, Tarek will, uh, will speak more about the, about the Gulf uh, states, but I will limit uh, from now on my remarks to the Mediterranean region, where the blueprint is the Euromed blueprint, set out in 1995, the Barcelona process, which essentially aimed to create a free trade zone in the Mediterranean, linking the northern part to the southern part, uh, by 2010. So that was the objective in 1995. Now, uh, the mechanics of creating that regional economic integration was to basically induce the countries in the southern part, A, to conclude a free trade agreement with the EU, which by and large is done, with the exception of Libya, uh, and two, to conclude free trade agreements among themselves. So it was a two-step process, and uh, if those agreements uh, were to be concluded, you would end up 
uh, it was hoped in 1995, uh, with a seamless zone uh, for free trade in the region. Now let's look at what happened. The first part of this project, <coughs> namely the conclusion of free trade agreements with, between Brussels and the capitals in the region, uh, as I said, with the exception of Libya, was completed. The problem is in the second step, <coughs> for a host of reasons political reasons, economic reasons, we haven't really seen uh, the type of uh, free trade agreements among the countries. Now, there's one exception to that, that's the Agadir process, but even there, there are only four countries uh, in that process. <coughs> so today we ended up with a system of what economists call a hub and spoke system, with Brussels as the hub and the individual countries as the spokes. Now. The economic impact of that, and here I'm going to quote again uh, the World Bank, uh, has not been overridingly beneficial for the countries of the southern Mediterranean. It basically allowed EU exports to those markets, so it consolidated the EU's market share, but hasn't really allowed the southern Mediterranean countries to increase their competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis the world, and to export beyond the EU. Now, in 2009, uh, the World Bank issued a report on the state of the uh, MENA countries. And uh, there, and I'm, I'm quoting, preferential agreements with the EU have not helped MENA countries withstand competition from China and India. They have partially helped maintaining a market in Europe, but the EU rules of origin may currently impede MENA's further export growth. Preferential agreements have locked MENA producers into production structures that shelter them from competition and handcuff their ability to source inputs from other locations. Now this is one uh, predicament. The second one, when you look at the state of regional economic integration and compare to the other regions of the world, the share of intra-regional trade in MENA is about 10%. In the EU or in Europe, it's 70%. In Northern America, it's 50%. So from that perspective as well, this Barcelona blueprint failed uh, to foster intra-regional integration uh, and to increase trade among uh, the countries of the Southern Mediterranean. The third argument is that this system of hub and spoke is also a disincentive for, for capturing foreign direct investment. Now, why is that so? Essentially because of the complexities of this system of rules of origin uh, that uh, necessarily come to the, uh, come to the fore uh, as a result of these uh, of this free trade agreements. There are a number of different rules of origin between EU and those countries between those countries that act as a, as a disincentive for FDI. Because from a foreign investor's perspective, why should, would I bother to invest, let's say, in a country like Tunisia, uh, if I'm going to be hit with a complicated set of rules of origin that's going to prevent me from exporting, if I want to, to Egypt? The better solution for the foreign direct investor is to invest in Italy, for instance, from where it can export freely to all of those countries without bothering with uh, these uh, complicated uh, rules of origin. So for all of these reasons, I have argued that there is a need for a fundamental rethink of this blueprint of regional economic integration that is now on the table. And what I have suggested uh, is to look at what has been achieved between Turkey and the EU and to extend that regime to the southern Mediterranean. That is, in 1995, Turkey and the EU uh, have concluded a customs union and not a free trade agreement. The fundamental difference between the customs union and the free trade agreement is that the customs union on the pro side <coughs> is a more integrated version. And it, does, it obviates the need for rules of origin. There is no rules of origin in the customs union. The downside is that the two sides of the customs union have to have the same trade policy vis-a-vis -vis third countries. 
So you lose uh, your independence in setting trade policy, but you gain in terms of uh, uh, in terms of economic efficiency and ease of trade. If we are able to extend the Turkey EU customs union to the rule, uh, to to the region, that will mean three things. That will mean we will not we will be able to eliminate all rules of origin and by extension eliminate all disincentives to foreign direct investment and uh, ensure a better regime for free trade we will also eliminate the logistical nightmare for a country like libya that for instance wants to re-engage with the world economy integrate with the regional economy this is a nightmare because what Libya needs to do, it needs to conclude an FTA with Brussels and 11 more FTAs with the regional countries, including Turkey, in order to enter this, uh, this space of free trade. With a customs union arrangement, a country like Libya would only need to conclude one agreement. And with that one customs union agreement, it would be able to enter the zone of free trade. And, and finally, uh, the, uh, apart from uh, this, uh, the logistical difficulty, there is also a political difficulty that can, over, that can be overcome with this. You wouldn't force countries, let's say like Morocco and Algeria, to conclude an agreement between them. They would just need to sign or conclude an agreement with the EU to enter the customs union and that would be the end of the story. After that, all barriers to trade within the region would be eliminated and therefore they wouldn't need, the, all of these countries wouldn't need to conclude an agreement between themselves and that in itself would also be a major achievement. Now, what is the uh, what is the downside of this? The downside is it would lead to a uh, elimination of protectionism, not only within the region but also outside the region. So the countries of the region would need to adopt basically the same trade policy as the, as the EU. How important is that? For some countries it is less, for some countries it is more. So we could indeed have a gradual uh, approach to this integration with countries that are already well advanced in their integration process uh, to, to join uh, the customs union. Uh, now, in terms of the consequences, and he, I want to perhaps add with, uh, with three notes here. When I talk about this in Brussels and beyond, uh, when I outline this proposal of changing the current blueprint of this web of free trade agreements with one single overarching customs union for the region, uh, I get overwhelmingly positive responses. With one exception, and that is the people who are in the European Commission dealing with trade. Uh, their counter-argument is that either for reasons of intellectual conservatism, because they want to protect what they've started, or just because of perhaps you know, less benign uh, matters, uh, dealing with mercantilism and dealing with the, uh, with the issue that the EU ha has, it has benefited the EU, uh, they don't want to talk uh, about this. But in, in, in other circles, they, I, I have indeed received an overwhelmingly uh, positive response. My second point is in terms of its scope. Now, this is the regime, the FTAs versus the customs union. But I haven't said anything about its scope. Today, the Turkey EU customs union is actually only about manufactured goods. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that way for the region. Uh, the customs union in itself can certainly be extended to agriculture or to services. This is something to be determined. But in order to extend this to agriculture, for instance, again, the signs are not very good when we look at what's happening, for instance, when Morocco and Morocco is trying to have an agreement on fisheries with the EU. 
and even there, there's enormous uh, political difficulties that, uh, that need to be overcome. Uh, so uh, on the agriculture side, which may be even the more beneficial part of this, at least in the short term, there certainly are challenges going forward. Finally, on the uh, perhaps theoretical level, if we are indeed going to enter a period with a more ambitious blueprint roadmap for regional economic integration, the countries themselves, in order to take advantage of this upscale level of ambition, also need accompanying policy. So it's not only about trade policy. You really need accompanying policies in order to fully take advantage of this more liberal, more open trading regimes. So what you need, in essence, is our fundamental reforms that would enable, for instance, uh, a new sense of entrepreneurship to develop. That would enable people, companies, to get access to capital much more easily than in the past. Uh, you need a liberalization of the banking sector. So the, the former rules of connected lending, uh, what we have seen quite prevalent in some of those economies, uh, must certainly be eliminated. And it's only through these type of reforms that the countries of the region can really fully take benefit of the type of free and open trade that I'm trying to champion here. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much for uh, offering uh, an explanation on very complicated issues. Uh, let me go directly to the, Dr. Puri for his uh, focus on uh, the Gulf regions economic integration. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, uh, and thank you for the or organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, I uh, will uh, definitely talk about the, the Gulf. I'd, I'd like to just make some comments about uh, sort of one issue that I think is uh, uh, brushed under the table when we talk about economic integration and economic development. I think it's the issue of uh, labor markets, uh, not just in the Gulf, but uh, of course in uh, uh, sort of the Arab uh, Middle East. Uh, and of course there is quite a bit of economic integration in terms of labor markets. Uh, so I'd like to talk a little bit uh, about this. I think it's, it's, it's important and I think that maybe uh, you know when we're talking about trades of, of goods and services uh, s sometimes uh, perhaps we tend to ignore labor markets and, and the ro role of labor markets in, uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and I think that e uh, the, Egyptian, uh, the Egyptian case is, is a case in, in point. Um, a lot of, uh, I have many Egyptian friends who have uh, high hopes for uh, the uh, uh, sort of the elections and so on in, in Egypt. Uh, the picture uh, economically is uh, quite grim in uh, Egypt today. Uh, private consumption has fallen uh, by half, so this is for uh, food stuff. Uh, pr uh, consumption of, of durable goods has fallen by 80%. Uh, and overall, the, the economic climate is, is, is not quite as, as good as it used, used to be. Uh, in the Mubarak years, not that I'm in any way uh, attributing this to, to his regime, in the Mubarak years, uh, economic growth in, in Egypt, as uh, Sinan pointed out, was uh, quite, uh, quite good. Uh, not terribly good for a developing country, but quite good at maybe four, five, six percent. Uh, this year, economic growth uh, is uh, uh, about one and a half percent, uh, and most economists tend to think that it's going to be about at that level. So that's a very low growth rate for a country like a developing country like like Egypt. 
the financial situation is also very uh, grim, uh, but it's more under the radar because the central, the Egyptian central bank, started out with about 36 billion dollars in, uh, in um, uh, foreign exchange reserves. That was pre-revolution. Uh, uh, now they're spending about two billion dollars a month just maintaining the currency at its current level. So they're down to 22 billion dollars. Uh, and given the uh, sort of the, uh, uh, the proportion of imports uh, that Egypt uh, su uh, uh, survives on, uh, they probably have another six to 12 months of foreign exchange reserves to be able to buy these imports. Uh, and with low economic growth, uh, you know, a devaluation is, is quite likely. Uh, bond yields in, in Egypt are, are through the roof. If you thought that five or six percent was bad, uh, you should look at Egypt. It's 13, 14 percent. Uh, inflation right now is double digit, but it's low. Uh, in 2012, it's, it's going to get much worse. Uh, so that's for the, uh, the good news. Uh, I'd like to sort of take a step back and think about where all of this social unrest comes from. Uh, obviously there's, uh, you know, the political uh, aspect which uh, I, I, I think uh, we're all aware of. Uh, but what about the economic aspect? Uh, what you notice for a country like Egypt is low wage growth. Uh, subsistence wage rates over long periods of time over the last 30 years uh, and uh, high inequality uh, and uh, uh, some poverty. The poverty tends to be sort of mitigated by remittances coming from the Gulf. Uh, but where does this low wage growth come from? Uh, and I, I think this is one aspect that we, we tend to routinely ignore. Uh, definitely I think there's uh, something to be said about the political system and the attendant uh, corruption and so on. Uh, but I think we tend to ignore uh, one fundamental factor that's driving, uh, that's driving uh, this, uh, these subsistence wages and that is of course population growth. Uh, population growth in Egypt is, uh, for the last 30 years, uh, it's been about 2% uh, per annum on average. This is IMF data. Um, in the United States over the last 30 years, population growth has been about 1% uh, per annum. Uh, in Europe, depending on the country, France is tends to be a bit closer to the US than, let's say, Italy. Uh, but if you're looking at uh, population growth rate differences of about 1% between uh, a developing country like Egypt uh, and, develop and, de and uh, industrialized uh, countries, uh, it makes a huge difference. Uh, in terms of per capita <coughs> income growth over a period of 30 or 40 years, right? So think about putting your money in the bank at 5% versus 4%. Uh, on the face of it, it doesn't make much of a difference, but if you wait long enough, it does. Uh, so I think population growth is one aspect that we tend to uh, ignore. Uh, and uh, certainly, I, I think there are some <coughs> policy issues that, uh, that should be addressed with regard to this. Uh, there's a real sense in which uh, no matter uh, how uh, transparent and democratic and uh, no matter how good uh, the economic policies that the Egyptian government uh, would enact, uh, there is a fundamental problem uh, uh, in, in the labor markets uh, that's, that's driven uh, by population growth. Uh, if you also look at, uh, so, so, you know, perhaps it's, it's 
something that's, uh, that is uh, quite uh, self-evident. Uh, but when you have very big uh, pools of workers to choose from, uh, that tends to push wages down. Uh, and that tends to drive up uh, the profits uh, of the companies that are operating in Egypt. Uh, and that in turn tends to drive up uh, inequality, income inequality, uh, wealth inequality, and so on. Uh, so what you have, I think, in a place like Egypt is high population growth uh, implying uh, high inequality of income and wealth. Uh, so I'm not saying that's the only factor. Uh, certainly corruption, uh, favoritism, uh, cronyism, and so on also play their part. Uh, but there's, in my mind at least, in a country with 85 million people, there's a limit uh, to that argument. Uh, population growth, uh, I think, is one argument uh, that has driven the social unrest, uh, but it's certainly not sufficient uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of uh, its impact on on uh, sort its social impact, right? And I, I think you mentioned the, the case of Tunisia. Uh, Tunisia is, of course, a much smaller country, much smaller country than than Egypt. And way back when. Uh, Tunisia uh, passed policies to control, uh, to uh, a, a sort of family, uh, uh, a family uh, management uh, programs uh, in Tunisia, which were essentially ways to decrease uh, fertility uh, in Tunisia. And certainly, Tunisia over the last 30 years has had a uh, lower population growth rate uh, than Egypt. As a result, uh, average income in Tunisia has been much higher. Uh, of course, that didn't prevent Tunisia from having, uh, from uh, sort of starting uh, the, uh, the, the wave of, of social unrest that, that we've observed. And that probably has to do with uh, sort of, you know, the whole political aspect and also uh, 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 some other structural issues that I think we tend to ignore uh, that have nothing to do with the, 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 the political uh, government, uh, the, the political regime in, in place. Uh, in particular, I think it's, it's important, once again, it, it might be quite evident to, to some of you, uh, that uh, Tunisia is a very small country uh, and it tends to be, uh, and small countries, by dint of them being small, uh, tend to have relatively specialized production. Uh, and if you have specialized production, well, you know, it's kind of a luck of the draw in terms of uh, uh, the attendant rate of unemployment. So if you look uh, instead of the United States, some sectors tend to be. Uh, tend to uh, do particularly well in terms of reducing unemployment. Others uh, tend to be very capital intensive, uh, but it kind of all washes, uh, washes out. Uh, and you end up with a, a relatively stable unemployment rate, of course, uh, except for the past couple of years. Uh, but with relatively small countries uh, that trade more or less freely with, with other countries, uh, it's a structural thing. Uh, free trade leads to specialization for small countries, and this has attendant implications on unemployment, uh, on unemployment, uh, and on uh, you know various measures of, of social inequality. And I, I, I think we we tend to ignore this. Of course, it's the government's responsibility to step in and and do something about it. Um, so I think that this is, this is w one aspect that, that I think tend, tends to be ignored. Um, <clears throat> a 
focusing a little bit more on uh, the labor market in Tunisia, something interesting happened in, in the past 30 years. Uh, unemployment in Tunisia, at least the official figures, uh, are, uh, stands at about stands at about 10 percent, uh, and it's been actually fairly steady. Uh, one thing that has happened uh, is that the Tunisian government has pushed for the creation of universities and colleges and in general uh, tertiary, uh, uh, sort of has encouraged uh, tertiary education. Uh, and what you've, you know, naturally when you're reducing or subsidizing the cost of tertiary education, uh, people will tend to uh, uh, go and, and, and get associates and bachelor's degrees and so on. Uh, what's happened, and that's, I think, is the interesting thing uh, in the last 30 years, is that the unemployment rate among college graduates has been steadily rising. So it used to be uh, maybe 5% in the early 80s, and now we're up to 15%. The 15% number, of course, being pre-revolution. Uh, I have no idea what, what the numbers are today. Uh, but you also have uh, this big labor market, so you have this big labor market imbalance. People go to college and they end up being unemployed. Uh, so what's going on there? Is it that it's the wrong uh, skill set? Uh, or is it that it's a developing country and perhaps the kinds of skills that you learn at university uh, may not be very well adapted to a developing country? Uh, so the group think mentality of encouraging higher education uh, doesn't strike me as, as particularly constructive. And I think especially now, you know, just to give a, another example, uh, is the United States where, uh, where uh, the debate about sort of, uh, you know, I've, I've read a few articles recently about uh, uh, too many people going to law school ending up with large uh, uh, debts after law school uh, and, uh, and ending up in a labor market that's, that's not very, that's not very uh, conducive to, to, to getting gainful employment. Uh, so I think that higher education, uh, if you look at the proportion of uh, money that uh, Middle Eastern countries, Egypt, Tunisia, and others spend uh, on uh, educational programs is quite high relative to OECD countries. Uh, I'm not sure that it's leading to the kinds of outcomes that, that they're hoping for. Uh, so I think this is another labor market imbalance that I think is, is quite interesting to, to address. Uh, Moving on to the, uh, uh, to the Gulf uh, states, uh, labor markets, of course, uh, over there are uh, also very interesting. Um, as as you, you uh, well know, uh, labor markets in, in, in the Gulf tend to be, uh, there, there's a, a big proportion of foreigners uh, in most Gulf states, it kind of varies. Uh, Qatar probably has the highest proportion. Uh, the UAE is probably second highest, and so on. Uh, labor markets in in uh, in uh, the Gulf are, are are quite interesting. If you look at the last uh, 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 30 years, if you look at economic diversification as measured by uh, growth in non-oil uh, and non-natural gas GDP has actually been quite good, right? So for the, for the past 30 years, depending on the country, you'll observe something between 3 and 6% annual growth uh, in the non-oil uh, sectors. Uh, for example, the UAE, it's about 5% per annum over a period of 30 years. That's quite good. Uh, and it's made possible uh, by an equal uh, uh, growth rate 
uh, in, uh, for, in, in the uh, number of foreign workers uh, working in the Gulf. Uh, so what you observe, once again, uh, for the United Arab Emirates, uh, you observe about an average of 5% population growth rate uh, 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 for, uh, the, in the foreign uh, workforce uh, in the UAE over a period of 30 years and an attendant growth rate in uh, the non-oil sectors of also about 5%. Uh, so over there labor markets are very well integrated uh, not just reg regionally but globally uh, and they contribute uh, to reducing poverty uh, in uh, uh, in North Africa, in the, uh, uh, the Arab states in North Africa, uh, and in uh, Egypt uh, and in Syria. Uh, and it, it, it accounts for the sort of the remittances uh, account for quite a bit uh, in, terms of, in terms of GDP, something like 5%, uh, depending on the country. Uh, so it's, 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 quite, it's, it's quite a lot of money. Uh, how about integration within the GCC? Uh, there hasn't been too much of that going on. I think there's been uh, quite a bit of political integration, which I think is, is quite a good thing. Uh, economic integration hasn't really happened. Uh, so the number that Sinan reported of about 10% intra-regional trade in, in MENA, uh, that number is a bit lower uh, for intra-regional trade within the Gulf states. Uh, and that probably has to do with the fact that uh, Gulf states are uh, importing, uh, uh, are importing mostly from uh, non-GCC states. Uh, uh, a, a big basket of consumption goods from food to manufactured products and so on. Uh, but there is quite a bit of uh, re-exporting activity uh, especially from, uh, from the UAE. So there's very little economic integration in terms of trade. Uh, there's been an effort at uh, monetary integration within the GCC. Uh, I think that that's a good effort insofar as it allows uh, GCC leaders to get together uh, to break down uh, political barriers and so on. Uh, but in terms of actually creating a monetary union, I think that the effort, at least so far, at least right now, is from a purely economic point of view, I think that it's a bit misguided. Uh, the GCC economies, not only do they differ, as you well know, in terms of their political uh, uh, proclivities, uh, but they also differ in terms of uh, in terms of their economies. Uh, GCC countries are uh, the business cycles of GCC countries uh, are not synchronized, uh, so they don't really fall into uh, an optimal currency area. Uh, that used to be something that. Uh, was a popular topic uh, for economic research in the 90s, optimal currency areas. Uh, but after the formation of the euro, uh, people said all you need is political will. Uh, and at the time, uh, only British scholars were saying, were sort of uh, ringing the alarm bell about uh, Europe uh, and potential problems down the line. And now it's uh, of course, the, the, the problem is, is laid bare. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, there have been efforts at monetary integration. Uh, I think that there, uh, th there's quite a bit of uh, work to be done in terms of uh, the political economy of decision making in the GCC, uh, how people make decisions, accountability, credibility, and so on. Uh, that issues that, that haven't been addressed uh, before a, a first step can be taken toward uh, monetary integration. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Started for uh, offering us some uh, of the uh, problems related to uh, the uh, regional economic integration. As you see, it's a very complicated uh, subject. And depending on what level of uh, regional economic integration are, uh, you know, uh, considered from uh, a, a preferential trade agreement to uh, free trade areas, to custom union, to uh, in, uh, common markets. I think there are, in each level, you have uh, many problems, many challenges to be solved, which actually relates to the uh, national interest of the countries who are member of that. On the other hand, put this in context of World Trade Organization, which actually 140 countries are members of the World Trade. And the World Trade Organization, which actually uh, calls on all nations that their laws should not contradict the, the uh, regulations and laws that are uh, established by consensus in the context of the World Trade Organization. So therefore, it is a very complicated issue. There, there are many tensions there. However, it works where it's a win-win situation between countries. When it does not work, actually they find ways to go around all these regulations and, and, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, kind of a standards that they have established themselves. You have heard as, uh, recently that there was a problem between France and the United States. When the, in the United States, the, uh, for domestic uh, you know, uh, uh, use or domestic production, the uh, champagne was called uh, sparkling wine, not champagne, because that's French champagne. But then the, the France was thinking to uh, you know, levy high uh, you know, uh, tariffs on uh, imported meat from the United States. Despite the fact that there are so many things between the United States and France, but these things happen. And now, um, you know, using the prerogative of chair, I would like to uh, ask the first question. And that is the, uh, when some of these region economic uh, blocks, integrations like uh, uh, NEFTA, North uh, American uh, Free Trade Association, or EU, become some kind of a re, uh, uh, kind of a economic fortresses. It shuts down other uh, countries for free trade to these countries with high tariffs. What is going to affect if, if you take all these strong and stronger and weaker uh, you know, blocks? How this uh, actually can react and how can this actually apply to the norms of the World Trade Organization that these can, all these countries are members. I would like uh, Senan and uh, Tarek to, to uh, uh, you know, talk about these and comments about these things. Now or? Yes, now. Yeah. Uh, well, a few remarks on that. I mean, this is really the eternal question about how much regionalism you want to have and how much globalism you want to have. Uh, the WTO uh, as a trade institution uh, obviously favors global rules, uh, but as things stand, what we see in different parts of the world is again a, a proclivity to go down the path of regionalism. Uh, we see this in the US uh, with their free trade agreements, lastly with South Korea, uh, we saw also it in the EU uh, negotiating a deal now with uh, India after the conclusion agreement with South Korea and so on. So there's always this uh, dichotomy between, uh, between these two uh, sort of proclivities. And uh, obviously the state of affairs within WTO with the negotiations of the Doha round uh, being uh, basically not advancing for a number of years now have I think pushed uh, policy makers uh, down the path of increased regionalism. So as long as we don't see a successful outcome to the WTO or Doha round of talks, I think this is going, what is going to be, uh, what is going to happen. This is, we're going to see more of a pr uh, push for increased regionalism uh, with the EU uh, trying to conclude more and more uh, tra uh, preferential trade agreements with a number of partners uh, across the globe. 
uh, and the same thing uh, to the allow to the extent that the Congress allows it uh, will happen in the U.S. Uh, and I think the way uh, to to overcome this issue of proclivity for regionalism is to address the, the outstanding issues uh, on the uh, on the WTO uh, Doha round, uh, which I think is the uh, is the subject of a whole different panel. Thank you. All right. Uh, no, I, I, I don't have uh, the sort of specific comments about, uh, I actually quite agree with you, uh, but uh, when you were talking about trade, I think the, the one issue that I was thinking about, and this is a conversation that I've had with some of the uh, uh, participants, uh, has to do with um, um, how free trade, um, I think, you know, as an economist, I, I uh, definitely, you know, uh, agree with the notion that uh, a, a free trade is uh, uh, something that increases uh, economic efficiency, it lowers costs, uh, and so on. Um, uh, my personal uh, uh, the, the uh, comment that I'd like to add has to do with uh, whether uh, especially uh, uh, whether it's uh, the Gulf states or Arab states more generally, um, how do we get to a point where we can develop uh, our own um, our own technologies, uh, our own uh, uh, capacity, productive capacity, uh, and and that seems to be like a strategic decision rather than an an economic decision. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let me open it for uh, questions. And, uh